I'll be talking about scenography uh, for playability. And we'll start out with describing what scenography is. <laughs> Thank you, Charles. Um, scenography is all the physical components you add to your game. It's uh, the location you play in, the backdrop you build up, all the set, um, the props you might use, and even the costumes of the players. All this counts as scenography. Oliver, keep to the left because you're walking into the uh -huh. You can walk further on the stage. Okay, but um, yes. So, scenography can do a lot of stuff, but we divide it into like two major ways it works uh, in game. One is if it's in the background, then it can work to um, show the world the game uh, is taking place in, or shape the way the players act in this game. Or if it's in the foreground, that means it's something active that the players use uh, during the game, uh, either as a function or a game mechanic. Now, uh, for showing the world, um, you can use a lot of different stuff, but LARP doesn't need any scenography to work. You all played the village, which has no need for scenography at all. You can play it pretty much anywhere, as long as you have a quiet space to do it in. And for many games, the fewer distractions, the sharper the focus uh, of play is. Um, as long as you don't have any things in the way of uh, what the game is actually about. Um, then you can add a few things to sort of shape up the play, like a tape lab, um, like we did when, in, when our destinies meet. It adds a little bit input to the players and the rest is supplied by their imagination and it gives everybody a very good um, chance to play along with some stuff that everyone agrees on but you don't limit the transparency of the game for example because everybody can still see what's going on. Then you can add a bit of basic furniture to the game. <laughs> um, you can use those as uh, concrete examples of what kind of setting you're working with. Um, or just show more about the world we're in. For example, in New Voices in Art, it wouldn't have worked without the art pieces on the walls um, showing that you were in a gallery and giving you something to talk about, uh, explaining the characters. And then, of course, you can add all kinds of fancy effects using uh, theatrics, like uh, light and sound. You can use it to add abstract and symbolic effects, or uh, alter the moods and feelings uh, of a lab. And I'm not going to say any more about this because there will be a very delicious workshop for you tomorrow by uh, Nina and uh, Alan. But uh, think of what happened in White Death and how the effects work there. And then, of course, there's the big magical full simulation games where um, you try to create everything as possible, close possible to the real thing. Uh, Celestra and Kapu were two examples of that. Celestra very realistic, even if it was in, in a space setting. And Kabul very abstract, even though it was more uh, realist, uh, more realistic setting of a prison camp. Um, yes, all right. The uh, other part, scenography you can do is shape the way you play. Uh, the players interact in the in the game. Uh, Winston Churchill once said. We shape our buildings and then they shape us, referring to how we always act the same in, in certain buildings. The fun part about LARP is that you get to be the ones who design the buildings and the players get to be the ones uh, shaped by them. The thing is here that if you try to emulate real life, it gets really boring. Um, because in real life, things are, are designed not to create conflict. In the city, you have the sidewalk where all the pedestrians walk, and then you have the cars in the street, and they, they never meet except when the light tells who can move uh, there. And the way we're supposed to act to each other is enforced in the, uh, in the design of things. Uh, in the buses, you have individual seats, so you don't sit and talk to other people, uh, for example. And that's because people are very predictable. Um, when we're individuals, uh, when we're just us, we do really strange things, all of us. We have, every one of us is a weird, uh, unique uh, person. But if you have a group of humans, they all tend to do the same thing. Uh, you can sort of predict where they will go and how they will react to things as a group. And they tend to be rather lazy and only do a, f a limited set of things. Uh, for example, players will always do these three things during a lab. They will avoid any unnecessary trouble that isn't part of a conflict that they want to play on. So uh, if, there will, if there are guards in the way of going to the toilet, they will go around them and not play with them if need to pee. They will seek out their relations, good or bad, if that means good role playing. 
Um, and they will hang out where they belong. Uh, the, if they have a camp, they will spend a lot of time there because they feel at home. So, uh, fun duty for you as a lab designer is to create new and interesting places for the players to play in. Um, design them how, based on how humans relate to each other and how they act to each other. And since lab is all about playing, you should also play with the spaces you play in. And that usually means you make some sort of plan about how the player is going to be. This is mostly for larger games with more players, uh, tape labs and, and such. And you find the places that players will need or want to go to during a game. If, for example, there's a place where the food is served, they will all need to go there during the game to get some, something to eat. And also if there's a place where everybody can have a, a quiet drink and relax and talk, they will probably want to go there. And you take these places and you spread them out across the area so everything gets used by the players if you want to, uh, to have it used. And then you put all the stuff that people would normally go to unless they were uh, dragged there between the places they want to go. So that if there is a place you want them to go but they wouldn't go on their own, they sort of have to pass it on the way between the place they eat and the place they sleep. And then when you do this, you be careful of where the places that people meet uh, or have to pass through. Because those are the most interesting places often, uh, where different people meet. Uh, from different groups or cultures, that's where the fun starts and, and interactions begin. But it can also mean that if one group has the power over who gets to go through the door to the auditorium, they will only let their friends through and nobody else will get to see what happens in the auditorium. And that will create boring play for everyone except for the group of friends. Um, and also for longer games, you want to give players somewhere they feel like they belong. A place to be home uh, that they can make their own and personalize so that they have some sort of base to recharge the energy and that they can uh, feel good about it. Uh, like, for example, your cabins here. It would be a lot different if you didn't have a place like that, that you would have to move around every night when you want to sleep. Um, and I go with players during a game too. Uh, it can also be used to make conflicts about who gets to go where, but be very careful about this, um, as you saw in the player pressure thing about not having enough sleep. Um, all right. And we also did a little experiment on you during Snap uh, we try some stuff out um, with the scenography here on stage. Uh, group C, we gave you a table in the, in the basement. Uh, group A, you had some chairs and poor group B had nothing at all. <laughs> and then we stood uh, aside and watched how that shaped the way you interacted with each other. Uh, for example, for group C, it was very often it turned into one big discussion where somebody was standing at the table and taking, the, the, taking charge and telling everybody how it was supposed to go. Because at the table, they could stand and look very important, like in a meeting. Um, group B often also gathered in a big clump uh, because there was nothing in the room to make them go anywhere else. So they stood in a big uh, circle and talked to each other or sat down in a circle. While with group A, there would be chairs on one side and the other. So people would be spread out and be in little groups and not having one centered conversation. And depending on what you want in your game, you can use this kind of design to uh, shape the way uh, play is. I'm just uh, going to make some more examples with my beautiful assistant uh, Trine Lise. Give her a hand. <laughs> Grab a chair. All right. If, we, uh, if we're a couple, we're having a serious conversation about our relationship. How we put the chairs uh, will, will give us a lot of different ways uh, of, uh, of setting a lot of tone about how the conversation goes. So if we sit opposite each other, it can be a very serious conversation, looking into each other's eyes, very romantic perhaps even, if we get to that point, um, that's one thing. If we turn them sideways, sitting next to each other, it becomes a bit more mundane. We don't look at each other as much. It can be a bit awkward, weird, or we can be sad and bored. And if we turn them all the way around, so we have the backs against each other, it might not be very realistic, but we will suddenly have like, this big space to express how we feel uh, in a more abstract way. Um, <laughs> that's just a few examples, as well as if we just have Trini on the chair again, just turn it to face them. Face them? Yes. yes. If we only have one chair, the conversation can become where I'm standing and you're sitting down. Suddenly there's a power difference here where I'm sort of, it feels like I'm lecturing you or telling you off, right? Yes. If I, on the other hand, would do like this, <laughs> much different conversation. 
Um, so think about this when you, uh, when you shape your spaces. Even how you put the chairs in your game will make a lot of difference. And sometimes you have to be careful with putting chairs in the game that the players can move around. Because I had one game supposed to have a lot of different things going on in the game, but the players ended up putting all the chairs together in a big circle, and nothing happened after they put them there, because they would all sit and look at each other in the eyes and, and talk it all out. And that made me really sad. <laughs> so thank you. All right. Now, about the foreground scenography. That's for people to interact with uh, to a much higher degree. Um, some of it can be functionally based, like the chairs. They have uh, an opportunity for us to sit down and, uh, and relax. And it is what it is in the game. It does what it does. And that also happens if you don't want it to happen. Uh, the reason we had a table in the first run of Snap Panda was that we didn't think about it, that it, was, that it was there. So suddenly the players had a table, and that changed how the game was supposed to run. And we learned something from it but it was out of our control because they used the table as a table, naturally. <laughs> um, Oliver, it's not that you can't have a table in that. It has to do a lot about what kind of room it is. Yes. If it's two tables in the room, that's a completely different story. Exactly. But uh, we didn't think about it, and something happened that was interesting for us. Uh, so even though you don't think about the design, it's always there in some way. And of course, also, props can have a more symbolic effect in the game, like the white balloons in, in White Death that uh, symbolize uh, dreams. Um, or they can be triggering of some sort of meta technique um, in the game. For example. For example, most of you can remember how much of an effect this had in Snaphane when it suddenly came out and was pointed at people. Um, that was a very powerful effect because the, the gun had certain rules on a meta-technical level that if you had the gun and pointed it at someone, everybody would be scared. But the gun can be a lot of different things. It could also just be a part of my costume if I want to play a cool guy. There were no rules for guns in the game, but I could still have it, so I felt like a cool, uh, awesome dude uh, and, and could walk around with it, hold it and look like a kind of guy. Um, it could also be a very important tool for me in a game where it's about shooting each other, where we had, like, if it shot uh, rubber darts, and if you got shot with a dart, then you died and was out of the game. Then this would be a very important tool for me, and I would want to keep good track of it. Um, and, of course, it could also have a much very, very uh, clear meta-technical effects, such as if, if at any point I draw the gun, the game ends at that moment, so that you play up until the point that the gun is drawn, and then that ends the game. Um, or different rules like whoever has the gun is always right. So you can't argue with the person who has the gun. So we can have an argument and suddenly someone pulls a gun and they are, they're right. Everything they say is true. Uh, <coughs> yes. Now, um, finally, I'll just talk about how to add more than just uh, the basic uh, stuff to the game, how to play more with people's senses. Um, I'm going to take the basic five of them. There are a lot more to play with, um, but let's start with the first ones. Our sense of sight is uh, the most powerful one we have. It's the one we base most of our interactions on as humans. It's a very direct sense. The things that you see with your eyes is immediate and, and obvious to you uh, in most cases. And, and you see colors and shapes and stuff. And you can play with this in a very obvious way to players. Uh, it's very hard to do subtle things, except with possibly with light and, uh, and shades. But most things will be very obvious to players and immediate for them. Sound is much more of a passive sense, so you wouldn't really notice what's going on with sound if you do it uh, carefully. Uh, but of course, it also has the alertness thing, so if suddenly there's a sound, people react to it. And often people forget that sound is a directional sense. We know where sound is coming from, and we use sound to hear what kind of space we're in. If I blindfold you and put you in a big space or a small space, you could hear the size of the space based on the echoes coming off it. Uh, and we also use that. Feeling is one of our practical senses. We use it a lot more than we think when we, uh, when we touch stuff. Um, the way we feel stuff gives a lot about uh, the texture and, and tone of the things. This isn't very ple pleasurable, actually. It's kind of rough. Uh, <laughs> And that can be used in games. So if you don't have, if you only have, like, 
cold co concrete and, and rough wooden planks. It's a very uh, harsh game, but if you put some, some soft blankets and pillows and furs and stuff, everything would be a lot more mellow and relaxed. Um, smell is a very under, underused uh, sense in lab design. We often use it to warn ourselves of something being unpleasant in around the area. We all know smells that make us not go to places, like some of the toilets around here. Um, <laughs> Uh, it often goes directly into the subconscious of us. Um, it can be a very strong memory trigger. For me, uh, Capo had a very special smell, one of, uh, of concrete dust and metal and wet acrylic paint. So if I get those things at the same time, uh, I can see Louise also feels the way, uh, I will go right back to, the, to that place because the smell goes directly into my memory center. And I think a lot of labs work that way uh, afterwards. And you can work with that. And then, of course, you have taste, which is a very personal and individual thing. People's sense of, of taste is often very personal and, and unique to them. But you can, you can work with it. Um, it's linked to smell, in fact, scientifically. Two-thirds of the things we think we taste is actually the smell of things. Um, but you can use it to, uh, with food and drinks to shape very specific exercises like uh, Emma did in uh, Melan Himmelhaf with the, having people eat clay and other unidentifiable substances to make them feel really alien. Um, and there are more senses, than, more senses than just the basic five we're taught. We also have the spatial senses that tell us where we are in a space and where our bodies are and Nina works a lot with those in her White Death and similar games. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, that's part of it. And uh, my sort of final advice on, on scenography is that often less is more. You don't need to put everything in the, the, um, in the mix to make a great lab. A few things can make a really effective game. For example, the Snap Panda has uh, three props. There's a confession, uh, the list of crimes, and the gun. And that makes for a very uh, clear uh, game, even though with only three things in effect. Uh, Capo had almost so much going on at the same time that you lost touch of what was going on around you. You were so busy being stimulated by strange experiences that you lost your character and it was uh, super confusing to be in there and that was sometimes in the way of actually playing a role and being in the game. So my final advice about scenography is that a little can mean a lot uh, and players Focus best on few things. Thank you. <laughs>